The title of this talk is A Spiritual Revolution, The Quest to Experience God. And I've had the opportunity um, since uh, the beginning of the fall to once again do it um, in person and have uh, an audience um, that I get to look at, <laughs> which is wonderful after many months of uh, doing it out of my little home office with just a little camera looking at me on my computer. <laughs> and uh, that was wonderful and I'm still doing that from time to time. But in coming here this afternoon, I was reminded of, and maybe you're familiar with this Bible story. If you, if you are a Bible um, student or someone that reads the Bible, maybe you're familiar with this. This is two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Um, they had had quite a falling out. Um, to say the least. But at a moment of reconciliation, Jacob said something to his brother, and it's what came to mind as I thought about speaking with you here this afternoon, which is after months and months of, for me, of looking at this little camera, seeing you, seeing your face is for me like seeing the face of God. That's what Jacob said to his brother in the moment of reconciliation. And I'd like to suggest something to you. The quest to experience God. You, to experience God, we don't have to be in, um, in a temple. We don't have to be in a mosque. We don't have to be in a church. Uh, we don't have to be at a lecture. But we can, we can experience the divine presence anywhere, anytime. But I'd like to suggest that you let this be a God moment for you, where you have an experience of the divine. Let me tell you about someone who did that and what happened for her. She came to a talk I was giving, this was some time ago, on the healing power of forgiveness. And what she had been doing in preparation for that talk was searching her heart and um, recognized that there was something there that she needed to address. And it was um, this resentment that she was carrying around towards her ex-husband. She said she wanted to come to the lecture um, and be free of this resentment, just the healing power of forgiveness to experience that. So as she came to the lecture, she knew, you see, her ex-husband, they had been divorced for quite a number of years, and she actually was happily married to someone else and thought she had settled this. But as she searched her heart, she said she realized there was this coal, this burning coal of resentment towards him. Apparently, he um, was an alcoholic, and she said living with him was like living with a constant tornado. And if any of you have had experiences in your own life dealing with someone with addiction, knowing someone, you can understand what she was talking about. And as you heard in the introduction, I spent, I actually spent 15 years in the mental health field. I was a psychotherapist and addictions was one of the area that, one of the areas that I had a specialty in. So I understood when she shared this with me. So she came to the lecture and she was listening and she heard, she had, you know, before she came to, she was thinking a lot about our relationship with the divine, with God, wanting to understand it more, to understand more about the nature of deity. And what I'm gonna be speaking with you about are the teachings of Christian science and what that shows us, teaches us, um, enables us to, to prove in our lives is that we each have a very, special uh, relationship. We are in, if you would, you can think of it as a spiritual unity with our divine source. And so she was thinking about these ideas when she came and she heard a statement that was, you know, um, carrying around resentment and wanting revenge or some kind of a, a retaliation was like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> now, 
She said there had been so much tumult already, the last thing she wanted was for anybody else to, to be troubled or to die. And so she made a decision right there in the lecture, in that moment, that she was going to forgive her ex-husband. And the way she was able to do that was by yielding to the presence and power and activity, the action of divine love. Love, God, that is infinite, all-encompassing, all-inclusive, unconditional, all-powerful love. And she made a choice, and that bomb of love just washed over her. And she said she felt completely free of that resentment. And she was healed right there in that lecture. It was a God moment, an experience of the divine presence. But that's not the end of the story. She gets in her car to drive home, and she had had no contact with her ex-husband for years. The phone rings. Can you guess who it was? It was her ex-husband. He was calling her to ask. Um, she, he needed her to do something um, for him uh, related to, to their history. And she was, you know, agreed to do that. And then she said, he apologized. He apologized. She said, this man never apologized for anything. He apologized for all the trouble he had caused in their marriage to her and to the children, their family, the disruption. Apparently, he was in a 12-step program, turned his life around, and was now helping other people with addictions find their way as well. That healing balm of love of divine love, knows no limits, knows no borders. It is a presence of God that is all powerful. So let this be a God moment for you. We are in the midst of a revolution. Those are powerful words. <laughs> And they were actually written by Mary Baker Eddy, spiritual revolutionary, medical reformer, um, spiritual pioneer, my favorite author, one of my favorite authors, if not the favorite author of mine. And she actually wrote those words um, in the 1800s. And she wasn't talking about a political revolution. Um, she wasn't talking about a, a sustainability revolution. She was talking about a spiritual revolution. And it's something that doesn't belong just to her time. It was actually happening before. Um, she wrote about it. it was very, you know, very, very apparent in her day. But this is something that has continued and actually accelerated. And so when I speak, like, just to, to be clear, when I'm speaking about spirituality and spiritual, let me just define it because I know it means a lot of different things to a lot of different folks. When I was um, uh, a therapist and on a search, I was just uh, looking for something to fill what <laughs> some call the God-shaped hole. If you've ever heard that expression, the God-shaped hole. And uh, I asked a group of inmates once if they um, if they had ever heard of it, and they said no. I said, do you know what it is? And one of the men said, fast as lightning, that place in all of us that only God can fill. And indeed, yes. And so I was searching and um, when I was thinking about spirituality in those days, I was very confused. I didn't really know what it was. And there were so many different ways to think about it. So when I speak to you about spirituality, I'm referring to what I understand to be the biblical understanding of that word, of that term, which is, you know, God is spirit. And that each of us, in our essence, in our very nature, in our core, we are spiritual. It's the essence of what and who we are that gets expressed through our relationship with our divine source, spirit. Each of us, all that we have, all that we are, all that we be, comes from our divine source, spirit. And so when I speak about a spiritual revolution, what is a spiritual revolution? Well, as I understand it, it is a seeking after something. It's, it's a seeking after something more than what the physical senses give us, do for us, a material sense of things, and a reaching for the infinite, the infinite unseen. 
that that's what, and what at the core of it, I think, at the core is a rebellion or a revolt, if you will, against a view of deity, an image of deity, which was my childhood view that I had been taught in the denomination I was brought up in, this idea of God's nature being both loving and compassionate, but at the same time, a God that can be distant and punitive and send suffering and wars and diseases and pandemics, that this God had this, this two-sided nature. I think there's an all out, I hear this from people all the time, both in my practice, um, professionally, and also just in my, in my day-to-day walk and meeting people when I tell them about what I do, um, that there is this rebellion against this idea of deity having this two-sided nature, being this, you know, people have said to me, I just don't believe God is this old man in the sky pulling puppet strings. That's not it, but, but there is a seeking, there's a, we have a heart to know God. That's what our creator, that's how we are made. That's what beats in all of us, is a desire to know deity. And I think that individuals are compelled, impelled, propelled to understand more of the infinite. And we see that played out in, in all different ways. So that's my understanding of spirituality and a spiritual revolution that is happening right here. And since you know, COVID and the pandemic, um, it has just, I mean, it was happening before that, but it has taken on epic proportions. There is a spiritual yearning, a seeking. People have really paused, I think, during this time and asking themselves, you know, well, what really matters? What do I really value? How do I want to live my life? How do I want to define myself? How do I want to be in this world? Those are some very deep questions and searching that is going on today. And I think that is all part of the spiritual revolution. Now, um, as I mentioned, I live in the, on the coast of Connecticut, Fairfield, Connecticut. The town over from mine is Westport. And actually in the 1960s, um, Dr. Martin Luther King was invited to speak there at a temple. And he gave a speech and it was entitled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. And one of the things Dr. King said during that speech was, one of the great liabilities of life is that all too many people find themselves amid a great period of social change, and yet they fail to develop the new attitudes that the new situation demands. They end up sleeping through a revolution. Well, the fact that you are here on this beautiful California Sunday afternoon or watching online tells me you are wide awake. You are not sleeping through this revolution. And it also reminds me of a verse from Romans where Paul writes, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you so your whole attitude of mind is changed. New attitudes. And I'm going to be sharing some stories, some examples of individuals, including myself, that have been working at developing those new attitudes, putting off, don't let the world around you, what the world says about who you are, what you are, what's possible, what's true, but let God, through that relationship with your divine source, remake you to be made anew so that your whole attitude of mind is changed. Yeah. Um, What does it look like or feel like to experience the divine presence? Sometimes people have said to me, that seems so mysterious. It seems so ethereal. It's not. It's absolutely so very natural to feel when you, for example, when you feel a sense of hope, you are experiencing the divine presence. And now hope, not a wishy-washy hope, but a hope rooted and grounded in your understanding or deepening conviction about the very nature of God, the nature of existence, the nature of who we are. You're experiencing the divine presence. When you feel a compassion and a love or a joy, you are experiencing the divine presence. 
or when you feel a sense of unity and brotherhood with one another, you are experiencing the divine presence. But now, this is not, as I said, this is not magical. This is not something that you just wave a wand and it happens. It's something we have to embrace and strive to live. We have to practice the presence of God. It's a practice. It's a thought by thought, moment by moment, day by day, yielding and striving to have those new attitudes, to let go of how the world tries to define you and tell you who and what you are or what's possible. Let me tell you about a friend of mine and what she decided to do and how this she was practicing the presence of God. Now this happened just um, right at the ver um, very beginning when COVID was starting to change our world pretty dramatically and pretty quickly. It was kind of like a, <laughs> it felt sometimes like, you know, a, a, a light switch just flipped. So um, testing for COVID was not really widely available at this point because it was so early on. And what happened for her, she started to feel um, extremely fatigued, but also um, she began to have difficulty breathing. And it was really um, uh, very strenuous for her. And so what she decided to do now, the practice of Christian science, it's a healing system that is safe, it's effective, it's reliable, not dogmatic. It's um, one is always free to choose how to care for oneself. Um, but my friend had relied on Christian science for her care, for her, for her well-being, for her health for many years and trusted it. And she also knew that it was an opportunity for her to learn more about who she was, who she is as the child of God. And so she turned wholeheartedly in prayer to God during this time when she was having, she had a night that she was really in distress. She had a great deal of difficulty breathing. And she said, she just prayerfully turned to God with, you know, there's a, a, a quality about prayer that I think is so helpful, which is this unreserved openness to God. That's a beautiful mental state to have when you approach prayer. And I've learned that praying for me is not so much about reciting words. When I was growing up, I was like, we just kind of like get through the prayers as fast as you could, <laughs> just say these as fast as you could. Um, but it wasn't, it's not like begging God, but for me, um, it's a, a, a communing and a quiet listening is often how I find myself praying these days. And that's what my friend did. She decided she was going to listen. And one of the ways Christian science helps us to understand God, based right in the Bible, is as divine mind, capital M, an all good spiritual consciousness, a divine mind that's imparting ideas to us all the time. So our job is to listen and to yield. And that's what my friend did this one night. She was in particular distress. And again, it was her choice in terms of this is how she felt she was going to be helped the most. She said, it's like, as she got quiet, she said, it was like someone spoke to her these words, all is well with my soul. And she said, she recognized it as from a hymn. And she said, all is well with my soul, all is well with my being. And she said it was a moment of spiritual illumination that what happened was she had been carrying around some concern about her health, questioning, you know, when, I don't know if this ever happens to you when you're not feeling well, but the what ifs try to take over, you know, what if this is serious? What if I'm not worthy? What if God doesn't hear me? What if this is, you know, what if, what if? And she had to address those what ifs with what is, what really is true, that God is caring for her and caring for every one of us, loving us, and that each of us is the loved child of God, held, safe, secure. And she said it was this illuminated moment where she understood that as the creation of an all good father, mother, God, 
Christian science helps us to understand the completeness of deity and that sense of fatherhood and motherhood of God. She was intact, she was spiritual, and she was whole. And she said, with that insight, with that illumination, all the concerns that she had about her health and what was going on just dissolved. And she said, with that, she felt this spiritual buoyancy, this that just stayed with her, and all of the physical symptoms completely dissolved. And she was completely well in that moment. She was practicing the presence of God, that humble yielding. You see, each one of us, and this is what, this rocked my world. When I was a therapist, let me tell you, this absolutely rocked my world, this view. First of all, she saw God as father, mother, all good. You see, that answers the spiritual revolution. It answers the, the rebellion against God's, the idea of God's nature as being both loving and compassionate, but at the same time, punitive and distant. God is an all good father, mother, and that each of us, we are not a bundle of material elements. That's not what and who we are, but rather we are a beautiful tapestry of spiritual qualities, faculties, and abilities derived right from our maker, from our spiritual source. Spiritual qualities like gentleness, like joy, resilience, perseverance, intelligence, wisdom, moral courage, spiritual strength, faculties and abilities like spiritual understanding, spiritual discernment. That's the truth about who and what we are. So here I was a therapist, just a little side here. I was a therapist. I had been taught that we were the product of biology and biography, you know, what our home experience was like, the genetics, you know, the heredity, um, education that we have, all the parentage, all of that, that that's, we were biology and biography. No, Christian science gives us new attitudes. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. But like, and that's what my friend, she let God remake her, see herself differently, see herself with new eyes in a sense. And when she did that, she was completely well, experiencing the presence and power of God right there. So for me, what happened as a therapist, I had been taught this biology, biology biography, that's who and what we are. And so, um, I start, I start, um, I was on this, trying to fill this God-shaped hole, as I said earlier, and I was introduced to the, the teachings of Christian science as part of what I see now as a spiritual search. I started reading Mary Baker Eddy's book, I said my favorite author, Science and Health, with Key to the Scriptures, and I thought, I just, oh my gosh, I have come home. It was this sacred space of understanding with the author. I've been reading this book. It's like, yes, I have always known this. This is true. This is real. This is genuine. And what happened, and it was because it gave me a new view of who we are, of our identity, of our individuality in God, that we are not this bundle of material elements, but rather that beautiful tapestry mosaic of qualities, faculties, and abilities derived right from our source. If God, it, it, it's like you can think of it as the sun, God is the sun, and each of us as individual ray of the sun. There's nothing in that ray that's not in the original, that's not in the sun, right? There's nothing in there that isn't from God, and there, there, um, everything that the sun is and has, so does the ray. And it was for me getting that perspective, and it, this is something <laughs> I still have a long way to go in understanding, but when I saw that, I realized, oh my gosh, everyone coming through the door for me as a therapist, this is what they want, this is what they need. Now, I have a lot of friends that are therapists and they're doing wonderful work. And they are, I mean, through this pandemic, their schedule, they have just been you know, flat out with the folks. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about um, uh, someone with a, a mental health issue in a little bit. But um, so this is my path. This was my journey in terms of what was right for me. Um, but I realized that these folks, this is what they're, this is what they're looking for. 
They're, they're trying to fill the God-shaped hole. And so um, after many years of lots of um, spiritual um, inner earthquakes and landslides and some mountaintop experiences, I made a decision one day and I took the shingle down with one set of initials and put them up with another set and um, started my practice as a Christian science healer because I thought this is a universal truth. This is for everyone. And this is what they, this is what these folks, how I, this is how I can be most helpful in this world <laughs> and in bringing it to others. And so um, for my friend, that healing, she said, I talked to her recently, she said, that healing has just been so meaningful to her because you know, with COVID, obviously um, there's so much fear that is, um, that, that so many, of us have had to deal with in all different ways. She said what happened for her with that clarity and illumination and experience, it was transformational. Now she's obedient to the law, whatever, she doesn't live um, you know, in, in this area. Um, and then she lives in another state. She's obedient to whatever the law is requiring in her particular community and, and in her state. But she said she was able to go about and do what she needed to do with a freedom. You see, that's the thing about Christian science. It sets us free with a freedom to do what she needed to do without having the anxiety and worry um, of, of, um, of this whole idea of this contagious disease. So you see, that's one of the things that has been so meaningful to me and um, what I, why I so wanted to help others with it. Because in the mental health arena, if you're depressed or you're an addict, if you have anxiety, um, it's like that's a part of your identity. That's who you are, and it's it's a part of who you are, and um, you can deal with the you know you can deal with it, um, but it's very much weaved into one's perception of oneself. Christian Science says no, 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 no. You have the right to be free of that. It is not a part of your God ordained um, identity, and you have the right to be free of it. That you are the loved, beloved child of an all good divine parent. In fact, each and every one of us, each one of you here in this auditorium online is God's masterpiece. Do you think about that when you wake up in the mirror and look in the mirror in the morning? Oh, there's God's masterpiece looking at me, right? Most people don't do that. <laughs> That's not usually the first thing you think of, um, I will say. It's not the first thing I think of. Um, but that, that is the truth, that each of us is God's masterpiece. And I think that this pandemic, what it has done um, is really had people kind of drill down to think about, you know, really, who am I? You know, how do I want to be in this world? Well, you are God's masterpiece. That's how we can be in this world. That's how we can think about ourselves and let go of those limiting beliefs that we, so many of us, we carry around about ourselves and who and what we are and what the capabilities and possibilities are. Jesus' example shows us, and what he saw, what he understood so clearly, was that each of us is that loved child of God, that no matter what we've done, no matter what we've experienced, what we haven't done, what we haven't experienced, that each and every one of us is that loved child of God right now, right here and right now. And Jesus, no matter what was thrown at him, whatever was put in front of him, Jesus confronted and overcame because he knew no matter what it was, whether it, whether it was a physical issue, with like, like leprosy, a contagious disease, or whether it was deafness or blindness or storms, um, or whether uh, it was a, a, a limitation or lack in terms of food, he knew that it didn't have any divine authority. And on that basis, it, wasn't, it was actually alien to God's creative purpose. And on that basis, he challenged it and overcame. He overcame it, he, whatever it was that was thrown at him. And Jesus understood, Jesus understood at the, at the essence of who he was, that his nature was divine, the divinity of his nature. And that, that in, in Christian science, that term for that divinity 
of Jesus's nature is also our nature. It's the term is called the Christ. It's the essence, the heart. It beats at the heart of every single one of us, that Christly divine nature. And what Mary Baker Eddy realized in her, she discovered Christian science. It was a discovery that for Jesus, spirituality, not materiality, was the reality of existence. That though we seem to be in a material world, that for Jesus, he saw through that. He saw, he saw beneath that to the true spiritual essence of who and what we are. And you know, in the Bible, it says, let this mind be in you, which was in, also in Christ Jesus. That Christly mind constituted Jesus's divinity, and it constitutes ours as well. You see, there is just one mind. There aren't many minds. I know it sure looks that way. I understand that. But there's just one mind, and it's what gives us the ability and the power to not let the world squeeze us into its mold, but let God remake us as we yield to that Christly mind as our mind. Now, Christian science, as I said, this is, it is not just blind faith. It's not just claiming God's healing power um, without understanding that there are spiritual laws. That's what Mary Baker Eddy discovered, laws that were in full operation, that could be discerned, that could be understood, that could be applied in our day-to-day -day life. And so it, there's a, it's the understanding that heals. And this is not just positive thinking, just thinking good thoughts, or it's not just, it's not mind over matter. Sometimes that is what some individuals think. It is not just like using willpower, but it, and it has nothing to do with Scientology, just to be clear about that. But it is the science of Christ. It's a way of understanding, and what Mrs. Eddie, uh, Mary Baker Eddy explained, understanding Jesus' life and teachings, a spiritual mentality that's at the essence, at the heart of all of us, and that we can each yield to. As we yield to that Christly consciousness as our consciousness, we can let that light shine through for healing for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, for our world. And goodness knows that's needed today, isn't it? It is desperately needed today. There's um, a story about Robert Louis Stevenson, the, um, the poet, the Scottish poet, author. He, um, when he was a little boy, he was in Scotland, grew up in Scotland. He'd be looking out the window at night, just fascinated because the um, street lights didn't just go on automatically. The street lighters would go up to the lamp. They had their ladder, they would climb up, they would um, take the cover off, they'd light the lamp, put the cover back on, come back down, and then go to the next one. And so little Robert was fascinated with this, staring out the window. And his parents said to him, what are you looking at? And he said, look at that man. He's punching holes in the darkness. Mm, punching holes in the darkness. That's what the Christly light does. It punches holes in the darkness. It would seem that there is a lot of darkness around us today. It would certainly seem that way. But that light of the Christ, that holy influence, it can't be silenced, it can't be ignored, it can't be put out. It is a holy influence in the hearts and minds of each and every one of us. Now, sometimes it can seem like, well, what about all, and what about COVID? What about the, the racial disparities that we're trying to reckon with in this country? What about the fires? What, what about the economic concerns? What about, what about, what about? Well, um, this morning when I got up, I had the opportunity, I was, I'm, I'm staying in a beautiful place, I've got water views, but off to the left, you couldn't see anything. It was, I'd seen buildings and I know there was water on the other side, but it's like they weren't there. Well, why? 
Well, there was a fog that had come in um, that was just covering everything. Did the, build, would, did, did the buildings need to be rebuilt? No. Did the, did, the, did the bay or the ocean need to be? No, it was all still there. What happened was, that's what material sense is like. It's like a fog. It's like a mist that needs to dissolve. That's all it is. What's really true about who each one of us are, that we don't have to create it. It's already the truth about who we are. That's another name for God is truth, capital T. It's already the case. But what needs to is there, we have to punch holes in the darkness. We have to dissolve the mist. It's like bad data is what it is. It's a distortion. A material sense of things, material sense, it's a distortion. And it's in opposition to our spiritual sense. In addition to each of us having a heart to know God, we have a, a, a perceptive faculty called spiritual sense that's innate in us. That's what tells us what's true, what's enduring, um, what's, what's permanent, what's good. It's our spiritual sense. And that's what we have to utilize to experience the divine presence and to experience more and more of God's healing presence and power and activity right here and right now. To have that mist <laughs> dissolve to turn from the bad data, to turn from a distorted sense of things. That's all, that's all it is. And so with that, as we yield to that Christly mind that constitutes our divinity as it did Jesus's, we can experience a greater sense of joy, of freedom, of health, of harmony, of holiness, of goodness, of abundance, of love in our lives. Another story about a friend of mine, another friend, punching holes in the darkness. I mentioned the mental health crisis, and um, this is something that started for him. He started when he was in middle school, he uh, became depressed, pretty significantly depressed and anxious, and it continued right up through high school, and so much so that he actually attempted suicide. That's how dark it was. He attempted suicide. Gratefully, it was not successful, but he was attending a Christian science Sunday school, so these ideas that I'm sharing with you, um, he was learning about this, learning about the nature of God's infinite love, that God is divine mind, that God is um, omnipresent truth. And he's like, I had this conviction though that God did not exist. So on one hand, he was attending the Sunday school, but he was sure God didn't exist. Yet, with this depression, again, it was his choice that with this depression, he felt getting to know God and experiencing God was going to be his only answer. Interesting, right? It's like that Christly light. <laughs> it, it couldn't be ignored, even though he thought he had this conviction that God did not exist. And so what he did was he decided he was going to read through science and health from cover to cover. Now, I don't know if anyone here has ever tried to do that, but um, I certainly have, and I've read the first chapter in Science and Health. It's a wonderful place to start prayer. I have read that prayer chapter many times. <laughs> um, but he read through that over a course of a number of years, he said, over a dozen times. And he had a dictionary in his lap, and he said what happened for him as he was reading he said he felt an irresistible sense of hope on every page. He said it was like pinpricks of light in the darkness. Right, just like those that, you know, punching holes in the darkness. That irresistible sense of hope, that hope, that was his spiritual sense communicating to him in a, in a way you can think of it that way. That irresistible sense of hope. And so he said, he persisted, and this was a really important point. He told me that he was um, not seeking outcome. Of course, he wanted to be free of the depression, but he wasn't seeking outcome. He was, ex he was seeking understanding. He was ex seeking an experience of God. I think that's pivotal in this. And what he, um, what he found was, he said, one night, he was pondering two passages, one from the Bible, from Psalms, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. He was thinking deeply about that. And another passage from Science and Health, where Mary Baker Eddy writes 
affirming the all power, all presence, all action, all good, all goodness of spirit. You see, her discovery was a recognition of the allness of spirit, of God, right here, right now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Not that there is a place that we have to die into to experience, but that right here and right now, this is our best understanding of the kingdom of heaven. And we can get glimpses of it. We can have experiences of it as we yield to, this, to these ideas, to the presence, to the power, to the activity, to the laws of God at work. And so um, there isn't a divine mind and a human mind. There isn't a spiritual universe and a material universe. This is it. This is it. There's one. That's what she, Mary Baker Eddy, discovered what she recognized. As I said, that Jesus knew that spirituality, not materiality, was what was true about existence. And so what my friend said, he was pondering those ideas, and he said, suddenly his thought became crystal clear. And it was like he was held, he said, it was like I'd been held underwater, and suddenly I would just shot up out of the, the water, and his thought was crystal clear, and he said he felt the divine presence. He said everything was suffused with the presence of God, with the presence of good, with the presence of love. And he said it was a defining moment for him. The depression didn't completely dissolve in that moment. He said, but from there on in, he had no doubt about that God was genuine, that God was real, that one could experience God, because that's exactly what happened to him. He said for weeks, it's like everywhere he went, it was just suffused with the divine presence. And then in um, a very short while, the depression completely disappeared, gone. And he was completely well. And he was completely well. And his conclusion is such a beautiful statement, I think. He said what he learned and took away from this I mean, there was many, many lessons because this went on for it was a number of years that he was working through this. He had to be persistent for sure. He said what he realized though is that when the need is great, the answer in Christian science is always greater. Yeah, why? Because the answer rests in the infinite unseen, in gaining an understanding and an experience of the divine presence, of seeing through um, the, 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 the picture, the material picture, to get that spiritual view. It's like, you know, when I was flying here, you know, the, the pilot takes us up, we're at 35,000 feet as we're cruising. It's like, you've got to get that spiritual altitude is what we're striving for. And God is causing us to know ourselves in this way. All the power of God is at work right now to help. If there's something you've come with that you are thinking about, concerned about, worried about, anxious about, you can know that God is right here working with you, for you, to help lift you to that 35,000 foot view and bring about healing, transformation, restoration. Because Jesus' life example shows us that through consistent prayer, through genuine repentance and reformation, turning from a material to an increasingly spiritual view of existence, that we can gain reasonably consistent dominion over matter and its discords, that that is indeed possible. And Mary Baker Eddy, just a, um, an extraordinary woman, lived an extraordinary life. And if you um, are not familiar with, you, with her, I would encourage you, and, and even if you are, there's a wonderful resource where you can learn more about her life the Mary Baker Eddy Library, and it's online, and you can read about her, and you can read some of her um, uh, various writings. But you know, when she was, um, she passed in 1910, and just a few years before she did, this is what was written about her, that she was the most famous, interesting, and powerful woman in America, if not the world today. 
She was an, an extraordinary spiritual healer, Christian healer. She healed others. You see, this is a science. It's provable. It's based on a divine principle, capital P, a way of understanding God as the only cause, the only creator, the only lawgiver. And that um, she healed others of, she had a long record of healing, of, of heart disease, of cancer, of paralysis, of physical deformity, of deafness, of blindness, and so much more. It's scientific. It's based on this divine principle. These are spiritual laws and they can be proved. And that's indeed what she did. But she, wants, she didn't want us to take her word for it. She said, you can prove this for yourself. And she says it right in her book. This is the Science and Health is the primary text on Christian science. She has, she has a prolific writer, author, but the primary text is Science and Health. And she writes in there, don't take my word for it, basically you're saying you can prove this for yourself. I would encourage you to strive to do that just as part of this spiritual revolution, to be striving to do that. But you know, this isn't something that Mary Baker Eddy made up either. It was a discovery. And this is how she describes her discovery. She said, the divine hand you see, she saw this as a revelation from God, led me into a new world of light and life, a fresh universe, old to God, but new to his little one. And that new universe, that light and life, that she said, new, um, old to God, but new to his little one. It's essentially, you can think of it as a new framing story for understanding reality, for understanding what's permanent, what's good, and what's enduring based on the allness and goodness of spirit here and now. And it's possible to experience that. And I've given you a few examples of that. And I, I'd like to share one from my own life that happened um, just last year. Um, it was, you know, we were, we were a few months into the pandemic and my schedule, like so many of us in my life, <laughs> felt like things got whoosh, turned upside down like very quickly. And there was much to learn in a very short time as like we put on our running shoes and like sprinted up the learning curve of living online. Um, but there were, there were a lot of demands on me and as I know on, on so many others, and I got a communication from someone that was not particularly kind. <laughs> it was um, actually quite critical uh, about something. And I was kind of, I must say, I reacted to it and thought, like, this isn't very fair or very nice or kind or whatever. Um, but put it aside, there was a lot of things to think about, but I you know, was stirred up. I don't know if any of you have ever felt that stirring, but I was stirred up. Uh, Anyway, so then um, within a short while after that, I developed a pretty severe um, physical situation. The whole middle section of my body became inflamed. And there were skin issues. I mean, it was just very, very uncomfortable. And I had quite a, a schedule and um, it needed to be addressed. And it needed to be addressed quickly because as I said, it's always a choice how to care for oneself. I've relied on Christian science for my health for many decades, and it's, um, it's, it's been wonderful. And so I turn to it. Um, I don't ignore it. Ignoring a problem is not Christian science practice. Uh, and I actually, it was um, a serious enough situation in terms of uh, what was going on for me physically as well as what I had to do that I called a friend who's a fellow Christian science healer to pray with me too, because I, I felt like I needed that kind of um, support. And something really interesting happened. Um, as we were praying, something came to light. And honestly, um, it surprised me. <laughs> and it also, I realized that it was something that um, came from God. And with that, that it was something I needed to address. And it was, that I had been carrying around for decades this very intense anger at injustice. And not a general injustice, but injustice towards me. And um, 
I, you know, it, I, I was kind of, whoa, where did this come from? But I knew it had to come from God because you see, as we turn with an unreserved openness to God in prayer, and as we strive to yield to that Christly light, to the divinity of our nature, any of those ungodlike offenders that we may have, attitudes, beliefs, resentments, fears, sorrows, grief, whatever it is, come to light because they need to, to just be moved right off because they're no, like I said, when I was, when I was a therapist, it, it's not a part of who we are. And so this came to light. And so I realized it had to be addressed, which I was committed to doing. But at the same time that this came to light, right along with it, it's like a movie of my life got played out in front of me. What do I mean by that? Well, I started to remember experiences, starting when I was a little girl, when things happened that shouldn't happen to little girls to times to some significant losses that I had as a young child in terms of fam close family members, to things that happened to me um, as a young adult, that things that happened you know, just straight on through to getting into the workplace and some things you could tuck up in the Me Too movement, to things that um, dissolving two marriages. Um, I'm married to a wonderful man now, but before that I, there were two marriages that were dissolved, to things in the, that happened and just recently in my community that were, was, was very, very challenging. And so these things came to light as I have this intense anger at injustice. But I knew that God is a just God. God is a just God. So if that's the case, where is injustice? Where can injustice live? It really can't. It really can't. But you can't just say that. You've got to live it. You've got to practice the presence of God. And so what I did was I made a decision. I had to make a decision. Um, do I want to be a prisoner to the past or do I want to be a pioneer to the future? And let God, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remake you. Did I want to let God remake? And I said, yes. And so I went through each of those circumstances and situations that came to mind, and I absolutely refused to accept that I was a victim, that, um, that, that I was helpless, or that I was hopeless, or that I was weak, or, and, and now this is not excusing or condoning wrong behavior. Let me be very clear about that. We're not, it, it, that's not what this is about. But it was about, this verse from Isaiah says it, it's so beautiful, where God's speaking, I will make my justice to rest as a light unto the people. God's justice. I had to be willing to yield up any sense like, you know, you, you, you want people to be held accountable. <laughs> you want, you know, you want a sense of balance. I mean, truly, there is some situations where it's like you want people to hurt, <laughs> maybe like you hurt or you want, um, I, I'm not suggesting any kind of physical <laughs> issues, but just where there's, um, I think it's kind of what happens. It's a pull of Paul calls it the carnal mind, that's enmity against God, a pull away from good, a pull away from good. But that it's, um, that's not a mind at all. Because if we accept there's only one mind, then that carnal mind is just a mental atmosphere of thought that needs to be uplifted. It needs to be regenerated. And so that's really what that pull away from good that would try. And so any of those feelings that I had, a feeling I wanted some kind of, you know, uh, reciprocity go, to go on. I had to know it's God's justice and yielding and trusting and deepening my conviction and yielding to that as, that, that as a light unto the people that lights up for everyone, that Christly light. So yielding to that. And that's exactly what I did. And I affirmed that I was never, this is another way of praying, denying what's not true and affirming what's true, that I was safe, that I was loved, that I had not missed out on anything. And um, the other, 
I think, pivotal moment was making a decision. You know, Jesus says we have to love our enemies. I don't know about you, but to me, that's probably the hardest thing that he's given us to do in, in many ways, that one of the hardest, if not the hardest, to love our enemies. But he, it's an agape love. It's the love that is God itself. That's the, the Greek for that love, word love, when he says to love your enemies. And that agape love, what that, what that indicates is an invincible goodwill and benevolence towards everyone and anyone. No matter what anyone has done to you, no matter what anyone has said to you, no matter how you have been treated, you don't allow any bitterness to grow in your heart. That's Christly light grace. And so that, when we live that agape love, what that love does is that it helps to lift, lift us heavenward. How? Because when we let that love permeate and purify our mental ribs, every bit of us, those ungodlike offenders, anything that is unlike the Christ, the Christ, the anointed one, who we are, God's masterpiece, dissolves like a shadow. And that's indeed what happened as I went through this and as I was striving to recognize myself as that child of God, but also anyone that came to mind as I thought about all of these circumstances over this like movie of my life, to see them and love them with the love that is God itself. Not something personally I had to create, but to just utilize that love by which we are loved. And that's what I was striving to do. Again, to be clear, I'm not excusing or condoning bad or wrong behavior. People have to um, be held accountable for what they do, but it's got in God's way <laughs> and in, in the way that God's going to do it, not something that I'm going to um, carry forth. And so um, there's another passage. Let me just quickly read this to you that was so meaningful to me with this healing. Um, where Mary Bickerty writes in Science and Health, the unlimited and divine mind is the immortal law of justice as well as of mercy. See, justice and mercy are wedded together. They're wedded together, justice, and it's the immortal law. Injustice is without law. It is alien to God's creative purpose, as Jesus knew so clearly. And it's no part of the divine creation. And so on that basis, I was able to turn from that and yield, and do you know, as I did that, the whole physical picture just went completely back to normal. But what was most meaningful to me and has continued to this day, now when I said this intense anger, I'm not one that yells and screams or jumps up and down, I don't argue with people, but what happens inside my head, you don't wanna know sometimes <laughs> what's going on there. But what's happened, what happened for me with this healing is that over this last year and a half, when there have been circumstances, when in the past I know I would have reacted and become angry, that hasn't happened. Remember I said freedom. That has not, been ha that has not happened. I've been free of that. It's been transformational, letting God remake me so my whole attitude of mind is changed. Well, this is one example of that. And I think Job <laughs> kind of concludes what his statement that is in uh, the book of Job, where he writes, injustice shuts its mouth. And that's what happened for me. And I was, I was completely well. I was completely well and have continued. It's just been um, a beautiful journey with God. So you see, Christian science really is about our freedom. It's about our freedom from all of that, all that would try to weigh us down, hold us back, or limit us in any way. And again, this isn't something that happens just once or like with a, a wand that you wave. The quest to experience God, it is a thought by thought, moment by moment, yielding to what divine mind is imparting to us. Our creator, our father, mother, God, divine mind, infinite, inexhaustible love, unchanging truth, is imparting ideas to us 
all the time, messages of love to us all the time. Are we listening? That's the question. Are we listening and are we yielding to what is being shown to us, is what is being said to us? Um, as I said, Mary Baker Eddy wants us to prove this for ourselves. She said, don't take my word for it. This was my discovery. I founded it. I've given it to the world. And now it's up to each and every one of us. But she does um, make this incredible proclamation in her book. She addresses, she had the deepest love. She dedicates her book to honest seekers for truth. She says, citizens of the world, she addresses the whole world, citizens of the world, accept, that's a very active word, the glorious liberty of the children of God and be free. This is your divine right. We have a part in that, always, always, always. Um, before I, I end, I'd like to just um, share with you my prayer for you, for us, as we go forward in this, because we are in the midst of a spiritual revolution. As we go forward individually and collectively, um, there's much going on that needs our prayers, that need us to live our best and highest sense of who we are as the children of God, that beautiful tapestry mosaic of qualities, faculties, and abilities derived right from our source, right from our all good divine parent to live that, to be that. That's how we experience the divine presence more and more. And as we turn from um, those ungodlike offenders, those beliefs, those, the way the world tries to define us and letting God remake us and define us, that that is what is pivotal for all of us. It will bless not just us individually, it will bless our families, our communities, our nation, and our world. Thank you.